we're just um, adjusting some tech, so we'll transition in just a moment. Um, and while we're waiting, maybe I can explain the agenda for this particular event. Um, so we're going to begin with some questions for the journalists, specifically about misinformation and disinformation. Um, and our journalists are going to speak to us about their projects. Then we'll go into a 20 minute Q&A. So if you have questions at any time, actually, and you want to raise your hand and ask it, you can. But if you want to hold your questions until the very end, you're welcome to do that. Um, and you'll have plenty of time to ask as many questions as you'd like. Um, so that's how we will begin this or how we'll run this particular event. I think we're still working on our tech. All right, so we're going to begin. I am so excited to introduce our journalists. Let's start with Sarah Aziza. Um, Sarah is a journalist who splits her time between New York City and the Middle East. She has lived and worked in Saudi Arabia, Jordan, the West Bank, and South Africa, among others. As a journalist, she focuses on human rights, refugees, women, and the Middle East, seeking to elevate the human complexity behind global issues. Her work has been featured in Harper's Magazine, The Washington Post, uh, The New Yorker.com, The Atlantic, and The Intercept, among other publications. Um, she is currently working on a book based on her reporting of women's stories in the Middle East. So are you, are, is that current? Are you working on that book right now? I am working on a book. It's a little bit different. It's uh, based on some reported um, family history um, related to the Palestinian diaspora, but it's not, that's not inaccurate. It's all, it's all in the mix. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you for being with us. Yeah, um, we also have Ben with us. Ben is a writer based in Berlin. He was a finalist in feature writing for the 2008 2018 National Magazine Award. His work appears in the New York Times Magazine, Harper's Magazine, Virginia Quarterly Review, The Guardian, among other publications. A former Fulbright Fellow, he taught literature and creative writing at the University of Iowa at Phillips Academy Andover, and he co-founded and directs the Berlin Writers Workshop. Hi, Ben. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's begin with some questions. And these questions are for both of you. I want to encourage you to, you know, answer um, when you feel, um, you know, organically that you have a response to it. Um, and, and both of and these questions are for both of you. So directed at both of you, but I'll probably direct it at one person first. Um, so just now the teachers um, were having a conversation about misinformation and disinformation, and we were trying to come up with some definitions. And I'd love to hear some definitions from you. Um, what are your definitions for misinformation and disinformation? And what are some key differences between these terms? And let's start with Ben, since I see you're um, off mute. Um, yeah, I... Since since you've had this conversation, you probably have thought more more about the distinction between those terms than I have um, in my work. I guess my intuitive definition would be that um, disinformation is kind of a subcategory of misinformation um, that they both refer to kind of false or misleading um, information uh, in in the context of journalism. You know, um, false or misleading facts or narratives. But that disinformation has the specific quality of being in intentionally spread or disseminated, whether by um, a biased publication or a government or a corporation or um, some other individual or, or organization. I don't know. Is that is is, is that where people landed, or, or or do people have uh, radically different ideas about those terms? Let's hear from the, the room. Uh, teachers, what did your definition sound like? Ben's definition? Do you have nuances that you'd like to contribute? Sounds good. All right. Sounds like there's a lot of agreement in the room. Sarah, I wanted to bring it to you. Ooh. Um, do you have uh, any additions to that definition? No, I feel like I was probably going to answer similarly to Ben. I think. Um, the purpose and or motivation um, behind 
you know, I mean, I think disinformation kind of implies that there might be an agenda, there might be a deliberate actor that wants to mislead, whereas misinformation can just be mistaken information or misunderstood, um, like miscommunication even. Um, so, so yeah, I guess I'm kind of in agreement with the room and with Ben on that. Thank you so much. So both of you recently led presentations uh, last week for the University of Chicago. Um, on the relationship between global conflicts and disinformation. Can you share summaries of your reporting, um, the reporting that you showcase in that particular webinar and the role that disinformation or misinformation played in each conflict? And let's start with you, Sarah. Sure, um, so my, I, I kind of took the, the overall framing of misinformation, disinformation and conflict a little bit, I feel like, a maybe an unexpected route in that um, I think a lot of people um, here in, in the United States tend to think of Eastern Europe or Russia or China when they hear the words or even like, um, you know, I've done plenty of reporting on like the Saudi tyrannical regime um, and the way that it's used technology to surveil and to um, misinform and disinform. Um, but I kind of decided to bring it home for my presentation and talk about how the Western media can advertently or inadvertently play into misunderstandings, incorrect portrayals and bias of basically anything, you know, um, but specifically speaking to the Israel-Palestine conflict, because I think that there are some specific nuances that are often left out and there are some some tropes and conventions in Western coverage of that that conflict um, that can sort of perpetuate disinformation. Um, so I kind of I covered that and then I broke it down into a few specific points that um, really encapsulate a lot of the main ways that the mini the media is manipulated or is manipulative or just incomplete or or um, uh, misleading in, in its coverage of Israel-Palestine. Thank you, Sarah. I want to uh, move to you, Ben. Can you share a summary of your presentation from last week about um, Xinjiang and China? Sure. Um, I talked mostly about my own reporting and my experiences reporting from the border of China and Kazakhstan, about um, re reporting on, on human rights issues, um, in Xinjiang, in, in Northwest China, uh, specifically related to their uh, Turkic and Muslim minority populations. Um, and I talked about, uh, I did talk some about misinformation. I kind of, I, my, my presentation was organized around the different kinds of evidence that can be brought to bear on situations where a story might be especially inaccessible or um, a story, a, a space might be inaccessible because it's, it's um, you know, the events are taking place in an authoritarian space that doesn't want um, uh, free uh, foreign coverage of the events that are happening there. Um, and I spoke about how kind of the varieties of evidence um, that different kinds of journalists can collect on a subject like Xinjiang uh, sort of together provide a, uh, a more solid foundation than any any one kind of evidence can provide individually to kind of counter state narratives um, like the Chinese state narrative about what it's trying to accomplish in in Xinjiang and what its activities are and what the what the kind of state of civil liberties are for its minority populations. And I talked a little bit about um, sort of in the vein that Sarah mentioned also how these narratives can get abused not only by um, you know governments like China but also governments like the US which have their own agenda when they are when they utilize narratives that journalists like me write about uh, places like China that are adversarial uh, that have an adversarial relationship with the US government. Thank you, Ben, um, and Sarah, of course. Um, all of you have covered, or both of you have covered a range of regions that have encountered many instances where disinformation or disinformation has been employed or misinformation has been generated. What are some trends around both misinformation and disinformation? And what does it look like? What motivates um, that kind of dissemination of information? Let's start. Let's start with whoever wants to start. Um, I can I can start. I won't answer in in entirety, but why don't I just like throw a few things out and then I can sure. 
can take it from there. Um, I think that some trends, I, I think I'll, I'll speak maybe more to the spirit of disinformation and misinformation um, in that I think that a lot of, let's, let's say, let's focus on disinformation. A lot of disinformation, I think a telltale sign is sensationalism or oversimplification, which often go hand in hand. So if there's a group that's being demonized in a really kind of like wholesale way, if there's, um, you know, I think attention to power dynamics is also really important. So if the state comes out always looking heroic or looking like the protector of the people, um, you know, that's a, that's a sign to me that this could be propaganda. Um, or, you know, something that's being used to cover over um, the truth or to, to, to sort of like cultivate or incite um, loyalty to the state. Um, so sensationalism, I mentioned earlier, I think fear kind of can dovetail with sensationalism. So if you're being made to feel very afraid about something, um, and um, again, if that fear is tied to a specific group or country that is being demonized in this instance, I think that that's an, another sign that um, disinformation might be at play. Um, and it also, you know, is, um, is a red flag for me that it could even just be incomplete and like kind of more on the side of misinformation, like, oh, you know, this one instance maybe might be true, but am I, is this story kind of like implying or extrapolating beyond what's really like tenable. So it's, it, it warrants further research um, and my own digging um, to see if the reaction that kind of like arises in me at like first blush is, you know, I'm speaking as a reader at, as well as a journalist, like if that's, you know, it, it's really just at this, at this um, juncture, it's sort of like indefensible to sort of just take anything at face value anymore, unfortunately. Um, but also fortunately, because I, you know, I don't want to imply that there was a time where media and information were, you know, just coming to us objectively and, you know, flawlessly. So this has kind of always been the case. And so I think that one thing that we worry a lot about in general, there's like a lot of hand wringing about misinformation, disinformation is, oh my God, you can't believe anything anymore. Um, like what's true? No one believes in truth. And um, yeah, it is, it does kind of get to feel really chaotic and there is um, a real danger of losing the sense that um, like, and there's anything, um, there's any such thing as credibility, like, you know, no sources are trustworthy or everything's equally trustworthy. I don't want to like imply that that's true, but I do think like a healthy amount of, of um, skepticism is actually like a great development for readership and journalists in general. So, um, so I see, I guess kind of like both sides to that. I, I think I kind of like went a little left of the question, but those are just- Oh, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's what we want. So please, thank you so much for sharing. Ben, I, I wanted to open up to you. Do, you. do you have anything you'd like to share on, you know, trends around either misinformation or disinformation that you're noticing? Yeah, um, I think, well, I'm hesitant to like, I'm hesitant to make any declarative statements about trends um, because I think there's a tendency. Um, I think we all have the tendency to kind of feel um, that events are accelerating in our own time in ways that they were not in previous time. And like a claim that I have heard is that, oh, d disinformation is on the rise. Um, and I'm not sure if that's true, actually. Uh, I think probably the average person is exposed to more uh, information and disinformation today than they might have been like in generations past. Um, there's higher literacy in most countries and more people are media consumers and people have social media, which means that they see more news, but yeah, are also probably more exposed to uh, these kinds of disinformation campaigns, whether they're, whether they're coming from a centralized source like a government or whether they are kind of like American right-wing media style disinformation campaigns. Um, I think probably there, there just is, is more, are more narratives being thrown at people, which requires a, you know, a kind of like baseline media literacy to be able to, um, to navigate. Uh, but I don't know that people have more uh, disinformed opinions or if they have those opinions, if they're, if they're at all firmly held. Um, or if they're more firmly held than they than they might have been in generations past. So I don't know. You know, if, if the question is is disinformation like going up or down, I would say that that's kind of an unanswerable question. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that that Sarah said about about kind of be, becoming a savvy consumer of information and not and 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 one of the one of the characteristics of of disinformation campaigns, which is hardly novel, like Hannah Arendt writes about it in the 1940s, that it is not so much about presenting a kind of unified deceptive lie. It, it's more about kicking up so much dirt um, and so many conflicting narratives that the average kind of consumer, the average citizen kind of has to throw up their hands and say, well, nothing is true, or I, I can't, I can't act on any, any uh, held beliefs. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that's something that I think, I don't know, in, 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 in media uh, studies or in media circles gets, gets mentioned a lot. And I, I, you know, I don't necessarily think that it's a, it's a novelty, but it definitely is something that seems to be certainly in, on a subject like uh, China or a subject like Israel and Palestine are is kind of just one one feature of the landscape. Um, and I would say that another feature of the landscape that I've noticed um, is a tendency for arguments about facts and events to become arguments about language. Um, so in 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 the field that I cover in, in talking about human rights atrocities in China, the question of whether this amounted to genocide, or not, uh, what became for kind of geopolitical reasons, um, the question that that suddenly became what was what was being written about in op-ed columns and on social media and, and by kind of China experts, by uh, China state media. And this question for me was is always secondary to kind of the, the concrete facts on the ground of what, what life is like for for Uyghurs and other um, you know Turkic and Muslim people in Xinjiang. I think you could say similar things about like the term apartheid as it applies to Palestine. Um, these are kind of uh, arguments that are parallel to, but are not the same as the kind of concrete uh, kind of work that that we deal in as journalists of establishing what what is happening to these these you know victimized uh, populations, and they can tend to kind of stand in for taking ideological positions or. or or, or making ideological claims that are that are somewhat removed from from kind of the facts of of uh, of for example like a piece of journalism that I might produce. Um, I think sometimes that's done inadvertently by people who want to have that argument, and sometimes it is a way of deflecting from from the facts of a report. Um, so that's another observation, I guess. Yeah, Ben. Thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, the point you made about language, I know Sarah was, was part of the webinar you conducted last week. I'm wondering in terms of the, in context of the um, Israel-Palestine conflict, is there anything you want to add to, to that point about um, the way language um, is part of this challenge with disinformation? Sure. Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. I think so in my webinar, I talked about four sort of like kind of almost grammatical conventions that people can watch for in like headlines and coverage of Israel-Palestine that are red flags. But really quick before that to um, maybe elaborate or not elaborate, but maybe jump off of what Ben just said about debates around human rights or apartheid and things like that um, and how those can kind of um, take us away maybe from the, the even more like human realities of a story. Um, I would agree with that, that it's, it's, um, it's dangerous to lose sight of, to sort of like center Western, um, even like legal arguments in place of what the, what the people on the ground, the people that we're meeting as journalists and trying to cover and represent um, what they're actually um, concerned about. But I do think that um, personally in my coverage and it, it, when I'm speaking to historically marginalized groups, groups that are oppressed or suffering, I really want them to lead me in the language that I choose. So, um, so there are some like um, arcane human rights debates maybe that are going on around whether this is a, a war crime or a genocide or ethnic cleansing in a given place. And that may have no bearing at all on this refugee's um, like personal experience or their, their concerns about feeding their children. Um, but if there is like, um, if there is real momentum on the ground around certain language or, or um, movements, I also want to make that plain. So 
Palestinians, a lot of Palestinians are actually really invested in the fact that Amnesty International and the UN, Human Rights Watch have called Israel's occupation apartheid. So because Palestinians on the ground are elevating that language and that's important to them, like I include that in my coverage, but I'm not here independently to make an argument for whether it's apartheid or not, but I'm here to let you know that these are what folks on the ground are saying, and this is what folks in these international bodies are saying, and these are dots that um, are accelerating towards each other, and that's interesting and unprecedented. So just, again, like to this being specific, but to the, to the Palestine conflict, but um, just a little more broadly to language, I, I just kind of alerted folks in my webinar. Sorry that there's a police car going by over here. Um, Passive voice is something to really watch for because passive voice often erases the actor in a given circumstance. So we talked about like protesters were killed. We can see this in US coverage of Black Lives Matter protests. You know, there were bullets were fired, you know, in cla you know, clashes, there were victims, um, Palestinians were killed. You know, in, again, going back to the example I used in my webinar from Palestine, Israel's not mentioned, the like context isn't mentioned wasn't mentioned that these were unarmed folks that were killed in a peaceful protest and it was soldiers that were sniping from the other side of a border wall. Um, so passive voice is something to watch for the absence of actors, you know, these people just died, you know, just like, you know, black protesters have been cited as being killed. Not they're they're either dying or they're being killed they're not being shot by police officers right which might seem like semantics to us but um, is something really interesting and probably not always unintentional and just because it's unintentional doesn't also mean we shouldn't watch for it um implying false equivalence again so things like again going back to domestic examples clashes between police and protesters that kind of sounds like two equal forces fighting one another um but we want to be paying attention to power dynamics and making sure that folks know if there's a government or you know a militarized police force clashing with teenagers, you know, in some, you know, in um, St. Louis or in Baltimore or in Palestine or wherever we're talking, like that should be made clear. So those are just a few examples of how language can um, do a lot without appearing to do that much. Thank you. Um, I also just want to, you know, Ben and Sarah, if you hear something that, you know, the other journalist says, if Ben says something that sparks something for you, Sarah, I want you to feel encouraged to just come off mute and, and share your thoughts. Um, you certainly don't have to wait for me. Um, and, you know, likewise, you know, Ben, if you hear something that Sarah says, I just want to encourage you to, to unmute and, and feel that you um, have the space to speak. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I wanted to just take a break and, and, you know, talk to our teachers. How are you feeling? Do you want to ask some questions? Um, do you have questions now? We can continue, but I want to make sure that your voices are heard, especially because we've heard already so much from these incredible journalists. Does anybody have questions before we continue? Do you want to come here? Because I think they can't hear you. You got to get the mic, friends. Yay, first question. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I guess it's more about, I guess, where, oh, hello, I'm Isaac, oh yeah, here. <laughs> um, I'm Isaac Rainey, I'm an MA student here. Um, which, um, well, I'm just curious, like, uh, what are maybe some differences or maybe difficulties and whether misinformation or disinformation is spread by, let's say, big institutions um, with goals or you know newspapers versus the more grassroots version of misinformation and maybe in some cases disinformation, but a lot of times misinformation. Um, I don't have any examples off the top of my head, but let's just say if a bad op-ed gets put in New York Times versus QAnon. Um, something that's more grassroots. Yes. Hmm. Uh, I guess I can try to go first, or or 
I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Um, I guess, uh, you know, when, when I'm writing for a place like the Times, it is comparatively difficult for a, um, for a kind of uh, rank falsehood to make it into my piece because it's being fact-checked. It's got a bunch of editors on top of it. Um, but, you know, when the Times is criticized, for its coverage in the in the way that Sarah kind of described is awesome be, often because of framing choices and language choices that just kind of shifts the center of the story or shifts the blame of the story. Um, now, of course, op eds um, I think are not always fact checked. So in that in a in in a case like that, you could also see just kind of straight falsehoods appear in 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 a place in a in a large publication like the Times. Um, when I see, you know, when I see online kind of small, I mean, I'll just use the subject that my presentation was on, which is Xinjiang. Uh, when I see kind of small independent outlets write about this story, I, I think um, there is some sometimes naive credulity in either direction with respect to um, that, that, it, that feels kind of uh, ideologically prior to the events being reported on as to whether um, whether to believe victims when they come forward and talk about things that have happened to them in Xinjiang or whether whether to believe the US State Department when they make claims about what China is doing in Xinjiang. And I think it is the reporter's job. And of course, a reporter can can write for an independent blog or they can write for the New York Times to sift through that information and use their experience as well as um, the kind of on the ground reporting that is that is the primary job that they do to be able to like prevent misinformation or disinformation from appearing in their article. I mean, I'll say that the, the way that you want disinformation to appear in your article is you do wanna, if, if, if there is a state narrative, you do wanna refer to it and contextualize it. And when I have published things on Xinjiang, I reach out to the Chinese government for comment and sometimes they do comment. And I think framing that, the, the state narrative within uh, the larger narrative that, that I'm creating, the, the frame that I'm building around around the stories of the people that I talk to is, is an important component. Um, and I think that's also something that's missing if, I mean, what was your example like QAnon, but you know, like, let's say it's like a somebody's blog or something. Um, I think it is easy to neglect the fact that although these kind of um, old guard traditional journalistic outlets have biases and have framing problems. And a lot of the problems come from, come from kind of structural forces as well as just the people that they hire to work there. Um, there are certain norms, there are journalistic norms that do function to counterbalance disinformation that you might not find if you're just reading somebody's Substack. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just agree with a lot of that. I think um, I can only speak for myself and the colleagues that I know in person, but it's a really odd time to be a journalist where we really do have to think about what QAnon is saying because there are really folks, who, I mean, it's a very strange thing to have that as your competition almost in a way, or just know that there are folks that have decided that even our most reputable sources, and I spent my entire webinar kind of breaking down what the New York Times does wrong, but um, it's still in some ways, um, you know, sort of a standby in a, as a check against hearsay and Facebook shares and all of these, all of the dark places that the internet can take us um, right now. And the, the fact that so many people have almost been like inoculated to use a very strange metaphor um, against all of the best practices that journalists are out here sort of with our blood, sweat and tears trying to maintain to get the best and most vetted accurate and well-rounded information out into the hands of the people. And that is like exactly like what we produce through all of that effort is, is, you know, people are just, there are certain people that are just primed to call that fake news and disregard it. And the people that are disregarding us as misinformation and disinformation are doing, perpetuating real harm and real misunderstanding in the world. And it's just, it's a very strange place as I'm sure everyone's aware. 
Um, and yeah, I would just, I guess I would just agree with Ben that there are practices in place, conventions in place, ethics that, you know, not everyone carries the exact same ideas of like objectivity um, and fairness and all of that. But I mean, I, I would just, yeah, kind of like echo in this case, every, I agree with what Ben said in, in the sense of, or in his description of how he tries to go about reporting on these issues, including the state narrative, framing that in a way that gives readers the chance to evaluate for themselves and to just know multiple sides of the story while at the same time trying to do good faith to um, a good faith job towards the, the folks on the ground. Um, yeah, I would agree with all of that. Um, and it's, it's again, just a strange world where the effects of QAnon and, you know, 4chan and 8chan and all of these, these places that don't carry any of those ethics or conventions, um, the effects of those places are comparable sometimes to the to the mainstream media, to the alternative media, to independent journalists that are trying to do a good job. And um, maybe it just, it speaks to the strangeness of this time. It also speaks, honestly, not to pat us on the back too much, Ben, but it speaks to the importance of, of good journalism. Um, it's kind of, you gotta keep doing it as much as it's getting strange and sometimes feels futile and frustrating. Um, and it's great that, that that gatherings like this are happening with, with these educators to talk about how to think about this and not just succumb or not just throw up our hands like we were talking about earlier and say, well, I guess you just never know what's true anymore because we can do better than that. Thank you so much. I think on this topic of, um, of being good journalists and practicing um, like strong journalism skills, how do we as teachers and students um, practice practice those skills when we when navigating disinformation. I remember in Ben's webinar, um, you mentioned that um, a way to counter disinformation is by collecting a diverse body of evidence. How can teachers and students recognize when there's not enough information and what strategies can they employ to expand their understanding of a global issue? Yeah, that's a good question. And even though you warned me that it might be coming, I don't have a Great answer, because uh, it's it's really hard. I mean, uh, you know, one one easy answer would just be to say, oh, you should read everything. You should read like a diverse array of publications. But um, if everything you're reading is, you know, a, a like right wing agitprop, then you're out. Then then it doesn't matter if if you don't if you don't know how to assess the quality of a of a source of information. Then it doesn't matter how many pieces of information you you get. You'll just be in that. Hannah Arendt situation of having so much dust kicked up that you that you ultimately have to throw up your hands and say, I just don't know what's true. Um, so I think two things have to happen. Um, I agree that like, the kind of showing students that there that that there is that both the quantity and quality of information matters. Like both both the number of um, you know, if if there is an, a witness testimony that's making an extreme claim, such that there's a mass internment drive rounding up Muslims in China, um, the the quantity of eyewitnesses matters. It matters if there's 50 people who have escaped China who are saying that, which, which is the case, or if there's two people who are saying it. Um, so that kind of quantity, you know, as as Stalin didn't actually say, but is often quoted as saying, quantity has a quality on all its own. Um, but you know, the quality of the information also matters. Like if the and and journalists have to be good at kind of at judging the quality of a of a you know, let's just take witness testimony for example. Um, if somebody's testimony is not stable over time, um, if it if it changes from journalist to journalist, um, then that might not be like a very high grade you know, witness. Uh, if, if the opposite is the case, if they can give quite detailed, um, you know, reports that stay consistent over time, then maybe it is. On the other hand, you're dealing with human beings and memories are fallible and people have trouble recounting traumatic experiences and they, they may not be comfortable recounting those experiences to you, but might be comfortable recounting them to someone who is different than you, who speaks their language, who is a woman, if, if they're, you know, something like that. Um, so there's all kinds of choices that you have to make as a journalist just to just to kind of judge the quality of, of information. Uh, but you know, as I talked about in my webinar, having having these kind of overlapping types of information, having witness testimony, having satellite imagery, having leaked documents, having speeches from political leaders in Xinjiang and in Beijing, um, 
having you know uh, other kinds of reports, uh, censuses that the government took that show IUD insertions for for Uyghur women in in a particular city or something. Uh, those types of information together, you know, provide a narrative. And I th I think learning to learning to kind of read beneath a story's narrative to see what the evidence is and what the different kinds of evidence are that that kind of are, are the are the architectural um, basis for for that narrative is an important skill to have. Um, and I think you know when I was young, when I was a student, the the newspaper, I got the Washington Post when we were growing up. It, it just kind of appeared and it was just the post. You know, it didn't occur to me that they were human beings behind every article, that those bylines meant that every person was kind of framing a story the way that they saw fit. And I think understanding that every story is being framed by a human being um, is also important to recognize. It doesn't mean that the Post is not a good newspaper, or that it's not as good as some other uh, kind of information. But um, you know, every story that I write is also framed by choices that I make. And if I, you know, if I were to choose a, a a protagonist for a story who is not somehow representative of the larger phenomenon that I was talking about. Um, you know, if I choose somebody who claims that they were tortured, but but 49 other people are not claiming that they were tortured, and I and I I sort of obfuscate that fact, then then I'm obviously not doing a, a good job representing reality. It may be true that this one person was tortured. Um, but the larger narrative is still deceptive. And I would say that it's still disinformation. Uh, just by virtue of presenting a, a kind of deceptive framing. Um, so just kind of learning to read stories like that as, as products of, you know, products where, where, you know, mortal flawed human beings are making decisions to produce a narrative, mostly in good faith, but, but not necessarily always in good faith. Um, these are the kind of skill, I mean, these are kind of central media literacy skills uh, that are, that are important and mu much more important than um, things that some people worry about, like uh, like deep fakes or whatever, which which I think that the 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 danger of of that kind of stuff of of fake images proliferating on the internet or fake videos of people making speeches that they I mean that's we're we're already in that internet with with text. We have to be able to judge if a tech if a piece of text is is reliable or not, if it's information or if it's disinformation, and and those types of skills we then just have to extend to other media, but but those skills will always be important for for consumers of, of news. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, ben. I also heard uh, a lot of similar notes um, or similar details to some of the issues, Sarah, that you spoke about in your webinar. I just want to give you space to add anything to Ben's talking points, especially in context of um, the Israel-Palestine conflict that, that you um, described in your webinar. Thank you. Sure. I mean, I, I think Ben did a really good job of um, sort of giving you a picture of what kind of work goes into coverage and when it in the best case scenario and, you know, maybe in less desirable scenarios. Um, and I do, yeah, it definitely just is um, like maybe the foundational step in establishing media literacy is just understanding the work of journalism a little bit better and understanding the choices that a journalist is making um, so that you can start to identify almost like you can start to see the seams of, oh, like here's a, I mean, like I, I agree with Ben, like I used to just consume news sort of like wholesale, like kind of just like, um, uh, what's the word objective truth um so just seeing like oh here's a quote and now you know like it's interesting the way they edited around that and like did they, they did they go to someone who might have a contradictory or what could this person's agenda be you know i'm now i'm echoing ben so just understanding the work of journalism so you can sort of like almost reverse engineer it for yourself while you're reading it and, and notice what choices are being made and what might be left out. Um, so I agree with everything Ben just said, and I, I might just add, I don't think he touched on it too much, but sort of like implied is do some history. I mean, like if you're really interested in, in knowing how to assess a piece of contemporary coverage, I think it really behooves all of us to go do some reading on, on the history of that conflict, this politician, um, this group of people, um, and, and just kind of walk back a little bit. So I used an example in my webinar of 
Um, I believe it was 65 Palestinians were killed, were killed, not by anyone that was mentioned. They were just, they just died spontaneously in a protest. And I sort of zoomed out and gave the group some um, more context. So this was the seventh week of a, of a siege in Gaza where they were being, you know, they had like their electricity had been cut. They were being denied COVID vaccines. This was um, a year ago and just sort of like the buildup to these spontaneous clashes because another thing that I, I point to in my webinar was like the naturalization of conflict or the naturalization of just like these clashes of like, you know, well, you know, Israel, Palestine, they've been fighting for thousands of years, right? Or I just don't understand why, you know, the Muslims and the Hindus in India just hate each other so much. It's just religious conflict, especially if it's not our religion. We just sort of accept that there's this savagery and this like fundamentalism that, you know, we don't have a problem with in our country at all. So, you know, so it's just sort of like, well, let's let's zoom out. Like maybe there's political reasons. Maybe these people are starving. Maybe these people have been let down by their failed state. And these this other religious group is being scapegoated. Maybe this is a decolonization effort that's being portrayed instead as just radical Islam. So just zooming out even just one year's worth or, you know, just one extra layer of historical context can reframe everything. Um, and then just really knowing the, the stance of um, the publication you're reading. Does this tend to be a publication that is a bit more hawkish, a bit more, you know, rallies around like the uh, war efforts by our government? Or is it more skeptical? So just sort of getting to know even just personally, like who is this journalist? There's some journalists that have been covering um, conflicts for years. I mentioned in my webinar that three of the people who have worked for the New York Times covering Israel-Palestine in recent years have had sons in the Israeli army at the same time and did not disclose that. It was exposed by other journalists. So even just knowing who this journalist is can be very informative. Thank you. Um, I have maybe one more question and then I'm gonna pass it to our teachers. I'm really curious about how technology is influencing our relationship with disinformation, whether it's like promoting it or how technology is promoting it, how is technology combating disinformation in the stories that 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 we're covering? So in your experience, specifically with your um, reporting process, what has your um, experience been with technology and the use of it around disinformation? And that's to either of you. So whoever feels compelled to answer first, please. Uh, I, I can go first, I guess. Um, I, I mean, I already talked about social media and, and some of the effects that I think are le legitimate phenomena and some of the effects that are maybe exaggerated um, in, in the popular mindset um, in terms of how news gets consumed and, and how disinformation spreads. Uh, one thing that I mentioned uh, that was a focus of my uh, webinar, my lecture, was the process of producing a, a kind of um, a, a virtual reality news piece, a, a documentary that, that was kind of multimedia and interactive and used different kinds of media technologies to tell a story rather than, rather than just write a story or, or, or take a picture. Um, and that, as I describe in the webinar, that posed some interesting challenges. It provided some different kind of narrative um, constraints and also narrative opportunities. Uh, I think it also managed to put this narrative in front of audiences who would not otherwise find a story about Central Asia slash Northwest China, who, who would not seek it out in, the, in a place like the Times or something, um, but who were interested in kind of the narrative possibilities of this technology. Um, and I know that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Sarah's familiar with forensic architecture because uh, they do a lot of work in, in Palestine kind of using, um, they're, they're kind of like interesting grassroots independent um, network of journalists and artists producing projects that, um, that, yeah, kind of, they're kind of forensic projects. They function in a space that, that is both journalistic and um, in, in the visual arts and in in other you know in, in other kinds of multimedia and audio technologies and and I, I often encounter their work in museum exhibitions um, and they 
you know, they, I, I would say those kinds of forensic technologies, I mean, they're tools, they can be used by governments, they can be used by, um, you know, large newsrooms of, of that have either a, any kind of bias, but they can also be used by by kind of grassroots organization. I think they're they're kind of a, a model for they, they were a model for us in, when we were kind of designing this project ourselves and trying to figure out how to utilize these technologies um, and bring them to bear on a on a story that we felt had a lot of journalistic importance and how to combine kind of the the interviews we had done and the and the recordings the, the kind of voice recordings and the images and videos we had taken with this opportunity to like dramatize and narrativize this story of of these re-education camps in a way that um had not been done before because of you know in part because of the technological um hurdles to do to doing so yeah that's a that's all really great um examples to raise i was hoping you would touch on sort of the interactive multidisciplinary examples because i think that there's been a lot of really great stuff um, on China specifically, you know, like to your credit and the credit of your colleagues, like I've really personally just enjoyed being able to explore that. And it does sort of almost seem like, um, you know, not, not art imitating life, but just like an appropriate answer to the efforts of a really totalitarian state to control in such a like enveloping way, the narrative around this thing. It's like, all right, we're gonna world build then to sort of in, in, in response so we can really like convey the story in such a powerful way. It's really amazing. And it is, you know, there are examples of that forensic architecture in other places that um, are doing similar work in other parts of the world. Uh, maybe I'll go the, to the other end of the spectrum to just add to this that um, on the very like minute level, like citizen journalism is becoming you know, just more widespread and more powerful in a lot of ways. Again, this is like, you know, kind of like that razor edge of hearsay and conspiracy and completely like undermining um, professional journalists and saying that like, oh, anyone can do it. Anyone with an iPhone is a journalist now. And I'm, I'm not saying that they're always the same, but I think it's a really important check on the, inst the major institutions of journalism that we now have folks that can live tweet from protests. We have, I, I use the example in, um, in my webinar of the Al-Kurd family in Sheikh Jarrah. Um, so that's a really contested um, neighborhood in Jerusalem where there's been a lot of protests, a lot of violence, settler violence, arrests, and it's really difficult to enter that, that specific neighborhood, but it's been sort of a flashpoint for a lot of what's been going on in organizing and in Israel's response um, in the last like, two years and, and before that. Um, I, I'm getting a sign that my internet's unstable, so I hope I'm still coming through. Um, so we've seen just examples even in, in the last month where the New York Times incorrectly reported the killing of um, Shirin Abu Akla um, in several, like they made several mistakes just in the initial coverage and folks were live tweeting you know just sort of like correcting them saying no that's not us like that that's not what we said that's not correct and the the times amended their article and then actually um did their own investigation and completely rescinded completely landed on the opposite end saying no this actually was definitely an elite israeli union that did this um and i think just that accountability factor is really important and and i've been meaning to mention this all day but um it's absolutely not enough for for English language reporters to be the one voice bringing the world to the English language world. Like there needs to be bilingual reporting and there needs to be folks speaking, able to speak in their native language to their experience. And so this is another way where I feel like um, people from their, from their own homes and from their own places like inside these conflicts who are able to, to speak to the world even in their own language. And then folks who are able to translate that language, I mean, that's its own burden and responsibility, faithfully translating, but um, but yeah, I'm just excited to see that more people are empowered to literally speak in their own voice, um, just really from the grassroots up. Thank you. I'm gonna open it up to teachers. Um, if you have a question, please come um, and please tell them your, tell our journalists your name as well. And if you want to, what you teach. 
Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Catherine Irving. I teach high school. Um, so my question is more advice from something that you all have said that's already happened in my classroom. Um, and it just kind of bubbled up, which I thought was going to be a teaching moment. Um, but then it instead kind of exposed what kids are believing versus what I'm trying to provide as truth. Um, so I don't know if you all saw anything about the supposed Ukrainian pilot who was an ace and who downed umpteen Russian planes until he was downed or something like that. But it was all over TikTok, right, when things were breaking out between Ukraine and Russia. So I was doing a case study on Ukraine with my students and they're like, oh, it's going to be, you know, there's this ace and he's shooting all these Russian planes down and we've seen it on TikTok. And I'm like, I don't think so. Um, so I started to research it and there were news reports from um, the Ukrainian military, from the government saying that would be awesome. Unfortunately, that's not true. This is a propaganda that somebody has put up there to kind of lift spirits and things like that. So I'm showing my students in real time, like, no, like this is, um, you know, the news that's out there. And I was talking about the, the sources and things like that. And them to me, they were more, no, this is the reporting on the ground. You know, that's the government, that's the military. Um, those stories, they're trying to cover up what's really happening, which is this hero. Um, so we had this kind of, you know, I, I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to by showing them these other sources and saying, well, you know, you're on social media, this stuff is, is uh, legit news sources. And they were kind of trying to tell me that um, I just am not connected to where, you know, the, the immediate news is coming from. So I couldn't figure, I mean, that was a small scale thing, you know, it was just kind of an interesting moment, but I don't know what I do later when it becomes like a bigger story that we're trying to, to um, figure out the disinformation. That's not a small thing. That's exactly it. That's all of the things. <laughs> um, that's a great example. And that's very tricky. Um, I don't know. I think I, I think I heard Ben was about to start to say something. I didn't stir up. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been in a, I've been in a classroom with, with high school age students and that sounds scary. <laughs> to, I mean, it sounds rhetorically scary to know how to, how to respond to that. Um, I mean, you know, I, Sarah already suggested one. I mean, I don't know whether it would it would affect this particular belief that your students have espoused, but Sarah has already kind of described the value of historicizing like events that they're seeing. Like, obviously, there's not on TikTok, but there's a lot of historical precedent for for war propaganda and the invention of like I don't know, you know, Soviet super soldiers, and and certainly the U.S. is done a lot of war propaganda during the Cold War and and a lot of that stuff is now um, kind of exposed and the and the kind of reality and the context for it is known and those those can be brought to bear on contemporary examples and they can be used as kind of an example to like treat treat stories that seem too good to be true with with some skepticism or that stories stories that seem like very simple or very um, cinematic uh, that kind of have a have a sort of Hollywood appeal. Um, everybody falls for these things. I've fallen for them. Um, you know, they're designed to uh, bypass the, you know, short circuit your critical thinking skills. Um, and they're, they're very sophisticated. And I think, you know, there's like a limited set of responses, but I think historicizing the type of propaganda or the, the type of narrative that they're encountering is, is valuable. And, you know, another thing that I wish I wish kind of like critics that I see uh, commenting on on news stories could better understand is just the the process of putting a putting a story into publication at at you know like a at a large newspaper and just the number of sources that you're that you're asked to kind of bring into justifying a claim and it, of course these systems are imperfect but I think it, if 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 there were kind of a better literacy around um, the amount of work it takes to like put out a put out a story, um, and the um, the seriousness with which publications take getting a story wrong is like as Sarah pointed out, the Times has done like quite recently, sort of in a in a really embarrassing, catastrophic way. 
Um, but there is, you know, there, there are at least kind of some institutional consequences for that. And I think kind of that um, understanding that process better can, and, and how that process is, you know, as flawed as it is completely absent on TikTok, um, where, where anything can, anything that like looks good can spread, um, can, you know, in theory, or maybe hopefully um, help students become more critical or skeptical uh, in their in their kind of encounters with stuff like that. Yeah. And I, I think um, one question that I always just think is worth asking is like, who benefits? If this is true, like, who, who does that serve? Like, in this case, you said it was a morale booster that the Ukrainian, that the, that the Ukrainian side was using. And so, yeah, I mean, it kind of, to me, that would just harken back to all the times other states have used propaganda to rally folks around, you know, from Rosie the Riveter on, you know, like myth and heroes, you know, Homer did it. So um, yeah, I think I think I just agree with everything that Ben said and just kind of question the who benefits. <laughs> just there, there's often a an agenda that's just one one um, layer beneath the surface. Yeah, thank you so much. You so and much. thank you for your question, Catherine. Do we have another question in the room? We have time for one more. Go for it. Come on for a friend. Hello again. Um, something that's come up several times is sort of the complication of, um, you know, when you in how the insinuation of something is debatable can constitute disinfo. You know, we've seen this a lot with, um, you know, the recent Sri Nabu Akhlaik case and a lot of other cases where presenting it as a, you know, both sides debatable issue can often completely go against what are, what is the reality on the ground. So this, I guess I'm more angling this for the benefit of the, the teachers in the room. So if you have to sway away in some cases from presenting everything as a debate, sort of how does that uh, then break down in let's say a teaching scenario? Sort of like how do you teach it if you wanna kind of maybe move, move away from presenting it as this both sidesy debatable issue when it's very obvious in many cases other sides are not debating in good faith. Sort of how do you teach it? Um, I, I really appreciate that question. I'll just jump in really quick um, because we had a great moment in my webinar where someone in the Q&A actually asked, you know, because I had presented sort of this idea of like objectivity being um, not the right word for good journalism because as been really well laid out, we're all human beings doing our journalism or making choices and journalism as a long purported you know, mission of, of holding like power to account, whether it does or not, and which powers and why and how and when, all of that is, um, you know, sub subject to question. But, um, but the idea of if we're gonna hold power to account, then we're inherently implying like, we're not gonna do 50-50, like fair and objective. So I, I, I present the idea like maybe fairness is a better way to think about like good coverage. And then someone asked like, what about um, using the word equity instead of fairness. And I was like, absolutely. I mean, I'm never going to forget that because that's such a good way to put it. I mean, equity is becoming a more, um, a word that I think we're hearing more in the last few years. A lot of companies are talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion rather than just diversity um, because equity really takes into account like what are the what are the power dynamics that are in play? What are the structures that we're inside of? What are Who are the people that are just, you know, functionally, like in a de facto way, at a disadvantage. What are the stories that um, that are, are less heard? What are, what are who are the folks that have that are actually suffering? Um, and how do we sort of like incorporate whatever in whatever specific story we're talking about? How do we incorporate the issues of justice, the issues of um, imbalances of power? and and sort of like all of all of those in our coverage that might actually mean not 50 50 like 50 percent of this article is you know going to be dedicated to the chinese government's position and 50 percent to the victims you know it's like that would people would kind of know in some scenarios that that's not fair um 
you know, the, there are good people on both sides. I, I, you know, there was a reason that so many people were in an uproar about that statement because that does not work sometimes. So equitable coverage for me would be making visible sort of like the invisible dynamics of power and sort of trying to correct for those in, in the amount of coverage I give to certain positions, if that makes sense. And, you know, I, you brilliant teachers could figure out how that translates to your pedagogy. I'm sure you can do it. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, I I really agree with that, and and um, don't know that I could add that much to it. I do think that um, you know I think students understand that disinformation is a, a permanent part of our media landscape, and I think for that reason, it is probably something that should be kind of explicitly treated in the classroom and studied. Um, like a student should understand how a, a false piece of information can go viral or how it can make it into a news report or how, um, you know, state actors can use Twitter bots to kind of make subjects go viral or, or kick dirt up around a, an event. Um, and I think, yeah, historical cases of propaganda should also be be part of a curriculum, um, if only because it helps us to recognize kind of a feature of our contemporary media landscape. And I think, um, yeah, if you're only looking at at good or equitable or fair or, or even handed pieces of journalism, um, then students are not really learning to recognize what they should be looking out for. Um, and obviously that stuff has to be contextualized properly. But again, I, I'm sure that the brilliant teachers here know how to do that. I think that's the perfect place to end. Um, thank you so much, Ben and Sarah, for um, this engagement today. Let's give them a round of applause, please. So their webinars will be up on the U Chicago um, outreach YouTube page, and you can follow them on Twitter. And I think you're both on Instagram as well, right? So, and their websites as well. So we will share those with these teachers. Thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good one.